I think there are two reasons why um, people are reluctant to use the word genocide. Uh, the first is a misunderstanding of the definition of the word genocide. Uh, uh, most people who um, who think about the word genocide have never read the Genocide Convention and so they don't know the definition, uh, which is the intentional destruction in whole or in part, I underline the in part, of a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. You don't have to intend to destroy the whole group for it to be a genocide or to be an act of genocide. Uh, and so um, what you have are a lot of people who use what I call the all or none school of genocide uh, who only would use the word for genocides in whole, uh, the Holocaust or Rwanda uh, um, or the Armenian genocide, where the objective was to in fact wipe out all of the other group. And so they, uh, they and if it doesn't reach that level, they won't use the word. I think that's one of the most common problems. Uh, I think the, the second problem is uh, a problem of political will. People who don't want to use the word genocide often don't want to use it because they don't want to do anything. Genocide is a potent word. It carries not only legal implications, it carries moral implications. It's the crime of crimes. And if you call something genocide, it creates either a legal obligation or a moral obligation. I think more strongly, in fact, a moral obligation to act to do something, to stop it, uh, or to prevent it. And a lot, of, a lot of countries, a lot of states don't like to feel obligated to do anything. They'd like to just sit back in their nice, comfortable capitals and let that genocide happen somewhere around the world to people who really don't count. And that is, I think, the main reason why the word genocide is not used. Uganda was once coined the Pearl of Africa by Winston Churchill. Located in East Africa, it is a former British colony, slightly smaller than the state of Oregon. Nearly one-fifth of Uganda is covered in water, allowing the use of hydropower and enough arable land to potentially produce enough food to feed all of Africa. Uganda's southern border is Lake Victoria, which is the source of the River Nile. Although Uganda is a land of great beauty and culture, it has become a land of great turmoil. The Nile River splits Uganda in half with a Choli land in the northern region. The southern region houses the majority of the population, mostly Baganda, along with the capital city of Kampala and the government and parliament infrastructure. On October 9th, 1962, Uganda gained its independence from Britain with Milton Obote elected as the prime minister. A year later, in 1963, Uganda became a republic. Later, in 1967, Obote introduced a new constitution that promised to give more control to the central government, especially to the office of the president. This action led to a major rift between Obote and the dominant Buganda kingdom, which Yaweri Museveni later used to his advantage in plotting terrorist acts against the central government in the early 1980s. But in January 1971, Obote was ousted in a coup led by Major General Idi Amin. Although Amin encountered some resistance by troops loyal to Obote, by the end of 1971 he had established control of the government. Amin's rule was notorious for its brutality, with an estimated 300,000 killed during the 1970, most of them being a Choli. In 1976, Amin declared himself president for life and began a campaign to claim areas of surrounding countries for Uganda. These attempts failed. With my speech, with my way of, of getting the ball, and when you me, you can harm yourself. In 1979, it resulted in a counteroffensive by Tanzania. During this counteroffensive, Tanzania succeeded in unifying anti Amin forces into the Ugandan National Liberation Front, or UNLF. 
On April 11, 1979, the Tanzanian army captured Kampala and Amin fled. The UNLF formed an interim government with Yusufu Lule as president. Lule, however, was quickly replaced by Godfrey Benaissa and then followed by Paul Mwanga. This rapid succession of presidential power characterized the Ugandan government until the general election of 1980. The Uganda's People's Congress, or UPC, won the majority of seats in the 1980 parliamentary elections, thereby ushering in Milton Obote as president of Uganda once again. A young Yoweri Museveni, who won only one seat for his party in the election, declared this voting process rigged and became a terrorist and a rebel leader, waging a guerrilla warfare campaign against the central government. Museveni launched his guerrilla warfare campaign in the Luero Triangle, right in the center of Buganda. The Luero Triangle has been the site of many of the worst atrocities in the country's history. And with the establishment of the present-day concentration camps in the north, that legacy continues. Milton Obote's presidency would not live to see the next election as he was removed from office in a nonviolent military coup led by General Tito Okello. In an effort to unite Ugandans, Okello felt it was necessary to enter into negotiations with Museveni and his National Resistance Army rebels to end the guerrilla fighting. In the fall of 1985, Okello's government opened negotiations with Museveni's NRA. The negotiations took place in Nairobi, Kenya, and resulted in both the declaration of a ceasefire and the creation of a new Ugandan government. According to this agreement, Okello would remain president and Museveni would serve as vice president. However, Museveni and his NRA kept fighting and overthrew his own government in January of 1986. <laughs> Since the Second World War, the Acholi people had held leadership positions in the military, police, and government. Museveni viewed the Acholi as a threat. Thus, he began a campaign designed to divide Northerners from Southerners. He cemented his hold over the government by removing from office anyone he felt was a potential threat to his power, especially those from the North or East. And within 10 years of taking power, Museveni began forcing the Acholi into concentration camps. Somehow, a strong educational system had managed to survive the political and social turmoil under Idi Amin and the various governments leading up to Museveni. But under Museveni's regime, most of these institutions in the north were left to decay. Meanwhile, schools in the south and west continue to thrive. Here is one of the many educational institutions in northern Uganda never threatened by the conflict between the Lord's Resistance Army and the government. More than half of the Uganda government annual budget comes from foreign donor countries, namely the United States, the United Kingdom, and others, including financial institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Various donors uh, are uh, obviously uh, cognizant of the problems that your country faces, uh, especially in the North. Uh, but I have urged the Secretary of Defense uh, in writing, and I've also talked to your uh, uh, permanent secretary, secretary of the treasury, to address two issues with the donors. One is that is the level of defence expenditures and what it is that you're that you see you're doing. Okay, mm -hmm. because at the moment nobody's saying anything and everybody's uh, drawing their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. The second thing in that defence expenditure is the question of the demobilized soldiers. And uh, I think you've got a problem in explaining to, to donors uh, the fact that they have paid for demobilization packages and some of these same people appear to be back in the armed services. And I, 
I urge you to deal with those issues in some way. I'm not telling you how to deal with it, but you know, somehow one needs to sit down with donors and uh, to, to map out. Okay? Over the years, Museveni's government's pretense to be a model of Western liberal economic policy has twice qualified Uganda for debt relief under the highly indebted Poor Countries Initiative. In the mid-90s, the period of HIPIC consultations, the Uganda government entered into a series of negotiations with the multilateral financial institutions, the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. The emphasis of HIPIC initiative was on grants for education and health, but the Museveni government preferred such funding for infrastructure and defense. But you have sort of a negative priority for some of the other stuff that uh, we've been involved with for a long time. For instance, uh, primary schooling and uh, basic health and uh, that like. Is that correct? No, sir. I think if one is forced, is it infrastructure now, roads or primary schools, primary education? If just either or, then he would say, program at this juncture, would say, let's have roads first. It's a question of uh, the balance, always. Okay. And uh, we need to discuss this because, you know, the way we look at it, the kids aren't getting educated. you got a health problem in, in Uganda that it would, is very, very serious. Right. Uh, we've got a, uh, the feeder roads are not being maintained. However, number of how many schools take primary schools, learning to read the Bible and the local newspapers, that will not help us to take off. We can go on growing coffee, but that won't help us really to move into the, so you feel like the secondary phase of industry, you know, of development. No, well, you can't go to the other side without this base. But I'm can't... saying that if the people don't know how to read and write and count, and add and subtract, they're not going to be able to engage in the modern age. Uh, that's all there is to it. Quoting the World Bank President Wolfenson, Museveni always gets his way with the Western donors. But this time, the stipulations of the HIPIC initiative granted a qualifying country grants for education. Hence, Museveni introduced Universal Primary Education, UPE, in Uganda. But uh, obviously we agree that um, roads are essential as well. It's a question of whether it's the only thing you do or whether it's the first thing you do. Or... So my guess is you'll get your way, which I think you're used to doing. <laughs> we'll have a lot of undereducated people using the roads. <laughs> no problem. They will, once they have got incomes. Yeah, then they'll live. Yes, 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 yes. They, they can fund their own education. Unfortunately, this policy has created different conditions for primary schools in northern Uganda compared to the southern part of the country. While school children in the north lack basic funding and supplies, schools in the south and western part of Uganda flourish. Museveni started a policy which, according to some of us, would have been not, not missing. You, see, you cannot make a policy as if you are trying to say trial and error. A whole president, don't you have advisors? Trial and error, right? You want to give in UPE, right? Universal primary education. That means you're going to push in more children to primary schools. But the first thing you do before you push children is to face out primary teachers' colleges. Is that the right move? That is it's very logical. How can you remove TTCs? You want the children to go, very many of them. The first thing you do is to get rid of the teachers. What, what, what logic is there? When Museveni opened Easy UPE, after facing out uh, primary teachers' education in mean, colleges, the children were there in the heaps. P1, 200, P2, 150, maybe, and so on. I'm a teacher and teacher trainer. If you tell me to find a teacher who is going to teach 200 children at a go because has failed to manage the class, I think I will be an affair to punish the teacher. So what Museven has done with his UPE is to destroy education in Uganda. 
you know, many schools were burned or abandoned. You know, the quality, when you go, when you go to some of these schools, especially the primary, you find, you know, children in one class there, like 100 plus, you know, children in the class, and maybe only two teachers, you know. How do you, how do you really reconcile this? You know, the proportion, the greater number with the number of the few, I mean, few teachers and educational facilities, you know, these are all big problems. These are big losses. You know, we have lost lives and we continue to lose lives. Uh, self Science Learning Center, Tiki Primary School, Marama BCL. See, they come from school at BCL. They are going to be able to do it. They are going to be able to do it. And they are going to be able to do it. They are going to be able to do it. They are going to be able to do it. They are going to be able to do it. They are going to be able to do it. The normal class, as per since we took off on British, is 45. You teach that class, you are able to work in the rows and do what we call individual coaching. In other words, you, you check each and see every child if the child is being educated. But now you give me 200 children. Within 40 minutes, only 40 minutes, 200 children. <laughs> Definitely. What kind of education? And the seven is proud of that, by the way. You are proud of bringing 200 children in your class where they will not be supervised or be even coached. And you say, I've, I've done it, I've, I've, I've put more people in education. But are, are they educated? He was saying he has pushed them to education. But are they educated? This is one thing that should really be scrapped out. You cannot take one man to teach 200 children. This young is playing but with your feet. The other one is singing. The other one is doing. What education is that? Museven is only proud of the number that has gone. But not who has got education. He only wants the number, not education. I think our oh man. Unless Museveni steps down education in the north or even the east will never succeed. One of the most uh, tragic and virtually irreparable loss out of this genocide is the destruction of a truly culture and civilization. Okay. This is the same culture that has brought us world-renowned people such as poet, scholar, and writer Okat Pabetek, international diplomat Olera Otunu, and Anglican Archbishop Janani Luwum, who was murdered by Idi Amin for his stand on human rights. The Acholi society is renowned for its deep-rooted and rich culture, value system, and family structure. All these have been destroyed under the living conditions prevailing over the last 10 years in these camps. This loss is colossal and virtually irreparable. It seeks not the death of a people and their civilization. prided themselves on their independence, on their ability to, you know, to live out in the countryside. And all of that, all of those values uh, are suddenly made a mockery of in a situation like a camp where you have 70,000 people trying to live together in one square kilometer. In the Acholi culture, 
It is the responsibility of the elders to pass along norms and traditions in the form of direct teaching and storytelling. Internment into these camps has made this virtually impossible. We are witnessing a slow death of this beautiful and rich culture. The following graphic gives one an idea of the size of a family hut in these camps and what, for example, family members of nine have been forced to live in. This situation has brought countless problems to the family structure. But the conditions imposed in the camps have systematically destroyed this because there's no longer the teaching of this culture the way they were at, at home. There's no longer the relationship between parents and children. Parents have nothing to offer their children. Traditionally, their children, parents live for their children, feeding them, paying whatever sacrifice to make them go to school, ensuring their well-being. Now they can't. And you can imagine the generation of our people of 20 years has seen nothing like peace, has seen nothing like normal life. Now what sort of people are they? The heart, the pain, the, 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 the psychological. Eh? All they've seen, recruited into the army, made to kill people, made to eat whatever. The, these people, these children, that's a generation lost. What shall we do? The Madame Ran Man and Anna Yeni. The team of Malan to get it. The team of Jackie, a bitch. Oh, Kerry Marabo, Malan to get the company. Cap it about you down. If you talk about one of your children, the values, the ethics of the society is all being destroyed. Until being forced into the camps, the Acholi built and maintained one of the richest and most vibrant cultures to be found anywhere. <laughs> Lawi Rodi of Acholi reflects on his childhood. Well, growing up in San Achot was uh, a very delightful experience because at that time there was peace and harmony within the society of Acholi. And the Chile people have a lot of cultures that are attached to the community. That makes growing up uh, quite easy because everybody takes care of every children. Inalkalatin <laughs> 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 
This is one of the richest, deepest civilization, culture, value system anywhere. The moral values of the people in northern Uganda, of the Asuli people, is gone. When I was growing up as a younger boy, we used to talk and say, oh, if you really want to get married and you want to find a woman that will never cheat on you, go and get an actual woman, they were number one. Since people don't have much money to buy things, young ladies intend to go about and then the spread of HIV is uh, terribly high here. You go to Kampala today and you go to what we call the Kampala Red District around the Speak Hotel. The majority of the core girls, the Red District, are from Achor. That's destruction of a culture. That's part of genocide. Now, who is the agent of genocide? What is the agency of genocide in Northern Uganda? Because genocide is a deliberate project. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen because a few soldiers are indisciplined, because a few battalions are not under control. No, genocide is a project. It doesn't happen by inadvertence. And the agency of genocide in Northern Uganda is the President of the Republic of Uganda, Mr. Yoweri Museveni. Again, let's be very clear. Museveni has been President of Uganda since January 26, 1986. Upon failing to gain entry to Makerere University in Kampala, the young Museveni was recommended by President Milton Obote to the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Upon graduation, Museveni joined the Ugandan Intelligence Service and was a close aide to Milton Obote. In January 1971, Idi Amin seized power via a military coup. With Amin fully in power and declaring himself president for life, Museveni and a group of supporters returned to Tanzania with the intention of launching an armed insurrection. By 1972, Museveni had formed the Front for National Salvation. Fronasa, as it was called, was a Marxist guerrilla group which operated out of Tanzania and carried out covert missions inside Uganda. Fronasa specialized in kidnapping and assassinating key military and political leaders within Amin's government. Museveni blamed the assassinations on Idi Amin. In April 1979, when the Amin government fell, Museveni was named the new Minister of State for Defense. In 1980, Museveni's party suffered a humiliating defeat in the Ugandan general election. After Milton Obote won the presidency, Museveni claimed the election was rigged. He fled to the bush and launched a guerrilla war against the very man who had helped him. On February 6, 1981, Museveni and a band of over 30 terrorists attacked a police barrack in the central Mumbinde district. This was a historic moment. Not only was Museveni the first African to launch a guerrilla war against a duly elected government, but he also introduced the concept of using child soldiers. Because what brought the children you want? In Africa here, even by the age of four, you learn how to fight. This is our tradition. If you don't know, fight with the sticks, with the spear, with arrows. That's the tradition. So if you are trying to think that this may disorient them psychologically and so on, that is not the case. I kill him. I kill the enemy. In the ensuing five-year civil war, over 300,000 civilians were massacred in an area of central Uganda known as the Luero Triangle. The Museveni-led faction, known as the NRA, or National Resistance Army, blamed the massacres on government troops. The government insisted, and indeed, mounting evidence indicates that it was Museveni himself who had committed the atrocities against the civilian population. 
We remember when the NRA soldiers went to a, a mosque when they were still rebels in a place called Ibulo in Ibutambala. Took people out on Eid al -Duha, one of the holiest days of Islam, brought them to a place called the Kamoya, tied them three pieces, and slaughtered and cut their necks as cows. Seven himself while negotiating with Tito Okello in Nairobi, boasted of having wiped out 40,000 UNLA troops. I can assure you that those could not be UNLA troops. It was only a brigade that fought with 70 in Luero. A brigade consists of 3,000 people. And the whole army of UNLA in Uganda at the time I was in power, was the whole total was 37. Now, assuming that Museveni killed every member of the brigade, the 5th Brigade, which operated in Luero, which was 3,000 people, the question now is, who are the other 37,000 people whom Museveni and his NRA, NRM killed in Luero? I, mean, I, th I think we have killed approximately, even wounded approximately 4,000 of the soldiers. On July 27, 1985, a bote fell, and Tito Okella, the former Obote army commander, took over as president of Uganda. In the Nairobi Peace Accord signed December 17, 1985, Museveni was to lay down his arms and serve as vice president under Okello, forming a new and peaceful government. This did not last long as Museveni turned on his own government, taking over the parliament building in Kampala in January 1986, declaring himself the new president. Between 1986 and 1993, Museveni, realizing he would get more money by aligning with the West, quickly reinvented himself and renounced his Marxist beliefs. But, but for us, we've been handling these problems ourselves. We should uh, really need a little bit of a metro from uh, the World Bank. <laughs> on handling multiple problems, balancing the budget, dealing with the bandits, dealing with the hostile neighbors, with only $17 million, it's quite a miracle. Right? You should make a statue for me in the, in the World Bank and IMF, say, small statue, say this is a man. <laughs> he formed a one-party system that he referred to as the movement. All oppositional political parties were banned and any public gathering whose purpose was political was considered treason. In 2003, Museveni started a campaign to end presidential term limits imposed by the 1995 Constitution. And in 2005, the Constitution was amended. In 2006, in controversial elections, Museveni was again elected to the office of president. You hear a good deal about the LRN government, and all gets confounded. Who is doing what? Well, again, let me just very quickly say that the LRA is one in a line of various rebel groups which have emerged in Uganda. Some emerged in, in the western part of the country, others emerged in the east, others emerged in the north, others emerged in the West Nile. All the others were defeated in relatively quick order, well organized, well armed, politically coherent, or all defeated. What has come in the way and has not been defeated for all these years is something called the Lord's Resistance Army. When the term rebel is used in Uganda, it most often refers to the LRA, or Lord's Resistance Army. The LRA is a rebel group operating out of northern Uganda, southern Sudan, and the eastern Congo. They've been labeled a religious faction and have shouldered the majority of the blame for the killing, mutilations, and abduction of children in northern and eastern Uganda. In order to obtain anti-terrorism funding from Western nations, Museveni has successfully had them and their leader, Joseph Kung, placed on the U.S. terrorist watch list. The LRA claims the government of Museveni is responsible for the atrocities committed against the people of the North, and therefore must be overthrown in order for peace to be restored in northern in Uganda. That group has been responsible, as we know, for massive abduction of children. 
is being responsible for naming the local community. Is being responsible for committing atrocities in various uh, uh, places. The LRA. The LRA. Why is LRA doing this? Whenever they've had opportunity to say anything, they blame the local population for not supporting them, for not supporting their war effort. And they call them collaborators. You are collaborating with the government. You inform on us with the government. That's why we must punish you and do this to you. That's the LRA. And the LRA must be held fully responsible for what they have done. And personally, I'm glad that the key leaders have now been formally indicted by the International Criminal Court and they have to go before that court sooner or later. But I have to tell you something else. Something else. That is only one dimension, one aspect of what is happening in Northern Uganda. Very sadly, very cynically, Mr. Museveni is using the LRA factor, using the LRA presence to provide a cover, to provide a pretext for conducting genocide in the camps. There are commentators and journalists who have gone all the way to northern Uganda and they have met the children who have been uh, escaped from the LRA. They have been to interview them. They have done long stories. Only a couple of miles away are the camps. They have not set foot in the camps. For two decades, a brutal civil war has been raging in Uganda. The government is fighting against the rebel forces of the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, which is led by an elusive man who believes he is God. Over 20,000 children have been abducted from their villages by the rebels. They are tortured and used as sex slaves and soldiers. It, it shouldn't... God, I don't even know how to put it. Um, the fact that these kids are running for their lives every single night is just unfathomable. But this just shouldn't be happening to children. Our next stop is Uganda in Africa. It's one of the most dangerous places right now to be a child. Take a good look at these young men and women. Only a few months before we met them, these teenagers had all been slaves, kidnapped from their villages in northern Uganda by a rebel army that calls itself the Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA. The LRA is led by this man, Joseph Kony, who claims to base his principles on the Ten Commandments. Kony's MO is to invade villages and kidnap children, brainwashing them and turning them into merciless killers. And as long as the NGOs, the United Nations and governments and the media are going on exclusively about the LR and the abduction of children, bravo, the government applauds them and gives them all the opportunity to say more and more and to define the situation exclusively in those terms, in these one-dimensional terms, because that way the sight of the world, the eyes of the international community is then completely diverted from what the government is doing in the camps. For more than 20 years, the Museveni government has successfully manipulated any media reports from northern Uganda. For example, from 1996 to 2000, during Operation Simpson, there was total news blackout. The government they had cut off northern Uganda. So what I had done personally, because you couldn't get into, the, into northern Uganda, I sneaked into Kenya. Uh, I got to Wilson Airport in Kenya. I flew to Rokichogio in northern Kenya. Then I walked through Nuba, and then I walked south through Dodothi, through the Chidepo National Park. And I ended up in northern Kitubo. So I interviewed people and I traveled back and I published the article in my newspaper of what was going on because no journalist was allowed to go to northern Uganda. Journalists in the Ugandan capital, Kampala, had to rely on the daily briefings from the army spokesperson. The government of Uganda 
has been concealing information from the international com community. Nobody knows about what is happening in northern Uganda. What the world knows about northern Uganda is that LRA is the only killer. What the world knows about northern Uganda is that all the atrocities have been committed by the LRA only. And yet, The reality on the ground shows very clearly that even the UPDF have committed a lot of violations of human rights of our people in northern Uganda. At Kao Parabek. It was NRA soldiers who killed people. It's straightforward. There's no question about it. 27 people were killed in the Kao Parabeke training center. The massacre at Yulele. That was purely UPDF, 1,450 mass grave. It's there. Documented the scene. That was not Konya. Because Konya is a rebel. Let's just assume he did it. He has no time to dig a massive grave and bury 1,400 people. Okay. And it was you who was the governor, that is Museven. You cannot, on the other hand, say that no, it is somebody else who came from elsewhere who came to do the killing. And strangely enough, it's important for the Ugandans to realize that skulls cannot speak. I will not be able to do this, but I will not be able to do this. I will not be able to do this. Since the LRA leadership has been indicted by the International Criminal Court, perhaps one day the truth will be known.